I'm Christian, and welcome to the Jamoir Leadership Podcast, a show where we talk about effective collaboration, influence, and leadership in an increasingly complex world. My interview partner is Dr. Dirk Schlimm. Dirk is an international leadership expert and the author of Influencing Powerful People. The purpose of this podcast is to share ideas and stimulate discussion, and it does not constitute professional advice of any kind. If such advice is needed, the services of a competent professional should be sought. The speakers, host, and Gemar International Incorporated are not to be held responsible for any use, misuse, or reuse of the content. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Gemar Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Christian, and I'm so glad that you're joining us again today. On the show today, Dirk and I are so pleased to be welcoming another amazing guest. On our channel, we have Mr. Byrne Christmas KC, and with Byrne, we're going to be getting into the fascinating, amazing, and ever so practical topic of negotiation. So please sit back and enjoy. This is part one of a two-part series. In this part, we're going to meet Mr. Christmas, hear a bit about his story, and begin the conversation. Then in part two, we're going to continue the conversation and conclude with a lot of information, especially for emerging and aspiring leaders. But for now, let's dive in, let's meet Mr. Christmas, hear a bit about his background, and get started. Welcome to today's episode on negotiating success at the intersection of law, politics, business, and culture, featuring our distinguished guest, Mr. Byrne Christmas, KC. Mr. Christmas currently is senior counsel at the JFK Law Group and corporate director specializing in Indigenous partnerships. He looks back on an illustrious career in law, business, public relations, public policy, and community leadership. He brings a wealth of expertise in all these settings with a specialized focus on Indigenous peoples. This makes him an influential and unique voice in the field of leadership and negotiation. Before founding his own law group, Mr. Christmas held significant positions that bridge diverse sectors. He was the Chief Executive Officer and General Counsel of Gippo Storms Corporation and a partner at Castles Brock LLP. His leadership extended to serving as the Senior Vice President and National Aboriginal Practice Leader at Hill in Knowlton, Canada, and as the CEO of Fort McKay Oil Sands. Mr. Christmas's journey is particularly notable for his groundbreaking role as the first Mi'kmaq to become a lawyer in Canada. Throughout his career, Mr. Christmas has dedicated himself to enhancing Aboriginal perspectives in law and business, negotiating for several First Nation bands, including the Member 2 Band of Nova Scotia. This included agreements with corporate giants such as Georgia Pacific, Starbucks, Lockheed Martin, Loblaw, and Ultramar. His work on national and international boards and commissions included appointments by Prime Minister Chrétien and roles with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and Canada Post Corporation. Last, but certainly not least, we would like to congratulate Mr. Christmas on his most recent appointment as King's Counsel. KC is a prestigious designation for lawyers in Canada, the United Kingdom, and other Commonwealth countries recognizing dedication to the legal profession and commitment to excellence in advocacy. Negotiation is a key skill for any leader in an increasingly complex world. And so we could not think of a better expert to illuminate the art of effective negotiation within diverse and complex landscapes with lessons on leadership, advocacy, and bridging cultural divides. Mr. Christmas, welcome to our program. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, kind words. Oh, of course. We're so glad to have you on, and we're going to dive right in. I'm going to start by asking a, a question, Mr. Christmas. Could you start by sharing some of your journey as the first Mi'kmaq lawyer in Canada uh, to law firm partner, CEO, and corporate board member and leader of a high-stakes negotiation on behalf of Indigenous communities with major corporations? Please tell us about that journey. Well, it actually uh, uh, it kind of started... Um when I was at uh, just a young kind of bar graduating and I uh, didn't really know what to do. And I, uh, um, like many 20 year olds you know, in around that age, I was kind of trying to find my way. And I, I uh, went to uh, an organization in uh, Toronto, Canada 
called the Native Canadian Centre and got one of my first jobs there and that was to work within the court system to liaise between judges, lawyers, uh, the police on behalf of uh, Indigenous uh, peoples that are about to go before the court. So it's more of a social social work type job and then um, then during the course, I met uh, lawyers and judges and and other people in the legal field, and they encouraged me to uh, attend law school. And some of them wrote some uh, reference letters. And uh, next thing you know, I'm uh, at Osgoode Hall Law School and uh, trying to figure my way out there, how uh, how to become a uh, a good student and a, and a eventual lawyer. And um, and then to get into what I've ultimately settled upon was actually at law school. In my first semester, I was speaking to one of the professors during a, uh, a lunch break. And uh, at the time, there were a lot of land claims and uh, mining deals being struck. Uh, one of them being the first one that was the Muscle White um, mining project in Ontario, the province of Ontario. And uh, we were kind of talking about that, and uh, the point the, the point that was made to me was, well, what happens to all that money in these settlements? And I, it kind of struck me. I said, wow, yeah, what what does happen to it? It goes to you know, obviously, grocery stores and car dealerships and snowmobile places and clothing stores all in around where the uh indigenous people live and um then i thought well there must be some opportunities there and then whammo kind of light went on and i actually switched from potentially being a criminal lawyer to a business lawyer and i started focusing for the next three years on business law programs and then next thing you know i'm uh, uh doing that and then i got a uh, a break with a big law firm in in uh Toronto, Canada, Bay Street firm, um, sort of the equivalent to Wall Street in in uh, in the United States, and uh, that's where it kind of took off and had some great opportunities there. Then went uh, did that for a few years, became uh, CEO of my own community, member two, and then uh, just kept progressing um, with experience from various types of deals that I started to get involved in. Wow, that, that's an amazing journey. And I'm sure just from he hearing the, the brief highlights that uh, there's a lot a lot going on there, a lot of opportunities, but opportunities taken and a lot of uh, uh, development and growth and challenges that you had to overcome. So thank you for just sharing that. That definitely gives us a lot of context going into this conversation, but uh, I think this is the part of the show where I'll hand things off to Dirk. I know Dirk and I, we've spoken about negotiation before on the channel and, and Dirk, uh, that's definitely a topic you're passionate about. So why don't you take the lead here, Dirk, in, in interviewing and I will sit back and take notes. Yeah, excellent. And I know Christian will be back a little bit uh, later on as well. And so um, with that, we, we can dive into uh, the negotiation part and Bernd, you have had you know, extensive experience, you know, from ind indigenous people's law, corporate, commercial law. And so first question mm -hmm. would really be, how do you adapt your negotiation approach to suit the varied cultural and business landscapes uh, you encounter? How, how, how does that come into, how does it come into play? Well, it's, it, I, I, before we start with that, I just I should let you know that in my early on in my career, uh, when I when I first took over as the chief executive officer for my own uh, community, member two, I uh, was made aware of a, a, a course at Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Governance on, on negotiations. And that was Barry Fisher. I think people might know him, very prominent um, Harvard uh, professor that uh, again had an amazing history of uh, negotiating some massive deals. Uh, one was the uh, ending of the the conflict in Korea between the North and the South, and uh, on behalf of the United States. And so, anyway, I took this course, and it sort of taught me how to negotiate one on one, one on five, one on ten, one on a hundred. And it was perfect because uh, to your question, Dirk, like how do you adapt? Like, you know, um, coming from an indigenous background, um, 
it's a collective. Our community is collective based. And so it, it involves, uh, you know, obviously dealing with individuals, but you have to bring the collective along into, into whatever you're trying to get involved in. And so, um, uh, you, you usually try to read the room and figure out what is happening within, uh, you know, a, a session, and uh, make sure that uh, everyone is uh, brought into the discussion and not just let uh, outliers uh, uh, be silent or be quiet and or and or potentially stew about something they don't agree with. You, you just got to try to make sure that they get all get involved. And it all goes back to ultimately accountability, because again, from my worldview as a indigenous person, you always have to be accountable to you know your community, and making sure that um, all the voices are heard. Uh, historically, um, I know my and uh, my tribe, the Mi'kmaq, have always worked on a consensus basis, and so you had big gatherings where you're trying to get you know, 20, 30 chiefs to agree on a, on a, on a point, you know, that takes a lot of time, especially when you get consensus where everyone has to agree, all 30 of them have to agree. So, uh, you know, you, you, you learn patience and you learn how to, uh, again, adapt to the circumstances. And uh, obviously sometimes consent in that form doesn't work. However, you can still, you know, adapt to the circumstances and the modern day pressures and uh, uh, create consensus, uh, even though it might not be the true consensus of each individual uh, uh, agreeing or not agreeing to the, the position you're trying to take. So that's how I, I would answer that one, Dirk, to start us off. Yeah, no, so, so Bernd, that's super interesting because when you when you think about negotiation and what you talked about i think in in the in the context of your the way you're describing is we're sometimes so focused on the negotiation substance right what's the deal how much money mm -hmm. and all of this but then there is a process right and yeah. it sounds like really from what you're talking about the process is as important or maybe even in your case it sounds like more important than the actual substance and if i don't get that process right I'm not going to get the deal right. And that process doesn't just involve the other side. The process also involves my own side, if, if, if you will. And so, so maybe that kind of leads into the next question I have here, the balancing of economic interests, but then with cultural and community values. And it sounds like this is what you were talking about, the importance of process and that. Just yeah, bringing, the, taking that back to you one more time, whether that's the right way of looking at it. Yeah, 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 for sure. You know, um, I was once fortunate to be involved in uh, here in Canada. We had the, um, it's a famous case called the Marshall, Marshall cases involving commercial fishing rights for mm -hmm. our tribe in uh, the North Atlantic um, off the coast of Canada and the 200 kilometer EEZ zone or economic zone. And, uh, you know, it's based on a, a treaty that was signed in the 1700s. And uh, we had the Supreme Court uh, agree with us that it's still valid because, you know, the British at the time changed the, the terms and we didn't. And they did it unilaterally, so they agreed and henceforth we got the commercial right. But during that time, um, it was uh, trying to get uh, over 35 Mi'kmaq communities that make up the, the nation and they're spread out over four provinces and parts of Quebec and trying to get them all to agree to 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 move forward in one uh, one way and that within a uh, uh, you know what you'd expect you know like you, you get a right to fish everyone expects okay I'll just go fish now and forget all the laws and the rules that are out there and uh, we didn't want to be seen as being um, uh, rule breakers law breakers and so we wanted to work with all the various uh, you know the government officials the provinces their their leadership and of course the fishing community and so the idea was how do we um, uh, exercise and begin to exercise a treaty right that, uh, you know, individuals 
were keenly aware of that their ancestors had negotiated, you know, over 200 years ago, 250 years ago. And then also the fact that fish and uh, sustenance from the ocean is a very important aspect to the diet of our community, both from a food perspective and a ceremonial perspective. And so, you know, uh, myself and others, we had to run that gambit of trying to make sure that we um, uh, got everyone on side and didn't make it look like that we were just kind of like the Wild West and crazy, uh, you know, uh, I'll use the expression, crazy Indians deciding that they can do whatever they want without uh, the norms of society uh, falling in, even though we had that right to do it. So it was uh it was an interesting exercise but at the end of the day we we were able to move the uh the ship and uh, at one point in early stages i was able to get all the communities to agree to actually holding a having a moratorium believe it or not having a moratorium on actually exercising that right for a month in order for <laughs> The government of Canada and all the provinces and all the fishing unions and everyone else to kind of get caught up after being shocked that we got this right. And it, 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 it Dirk, it required a lot of, uh, you know, I, I remember traveling and, um, and others traveling from community to community, explaining what's going on and why we are doing it in such a way. And of course, you had competing interests and uh, you had to convince them that this was the, um, you had to pick out a, a, a bigger motherhood issue and get them to focus on that, i.e. the treaty right versus, in this case, say how they individually would, um, would benefit. So we got them to think about the, the big motherhood issue to, in order to keep them from, um, you know, doing some stuff that might have damaged our reputation. So uh, that's how we kind of uh, took care of that situation. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, fascinating, Bernd. And, and so again, you know, really you're, you're describing what consensus building really looks like. And, you know, I would even think, you know, all the people we're talking about are in a room, but 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 they're not, right? You're you're here with a yeah. very uh, dispersed group of people, and you're saying you're you're, you're traveling, and and uh, so that that brings it that brings it to life. And if you if you take that now, uh, would be a question you have done word on on other bodies, on boards, on international boards, and in regulatory commercial environments. Is there something mm -hmm. there that would saying here is an innovation innovative negotiation? tactic or approach or strategy that you think would translate into like an international commercial setting or regulatory setting where you're saying from this I've learned something that is probably good to do in other environments as well that other people can learn from this this could be a negotiation innovation so to speak yeah I don't know if it's an innovation because you know most of the stuff has been taught you know handed down time after time but you know some of the uh, you know some of the initiatives that have been involved in, like Canada Post, for example, wanted to uh, instigate a. Um, well, actually, they didn't want to do it until I started bringing it up. The idea of a uh, Aboriginal procurement and supplier program that was global, and figuring out how do we get companies, say in Germany, to partner up with uh, you know indigenous business entrepreneurs in Canada in order to supply a, a product in uh, the Canada Post uses uh, wherever they have their operations. And um, uh, and then you know we've we dealt with uh, companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin, all those big aerospace companies and um, the big food service companies, the uh, out of Paris, at Exo, um, like like in my introduction, Starbucks, like all these international companies. And what I have always noticed is, you know, at the end of the day, it's the uh, bottom line that they're trying to to uh, to meet and maximize shareholder value. Um, but in our context, from the indigenous side, we're trying to get involved with them to either boost up our credibility on our particular business line that we're trying to get involved in, or to leverage them to open up other other doors. There's, uh, and then and ultimately, then also ourselves make some money. 
So in dealing with those companies, I always find that the, I don't know, the big secret is, but just trying to explain from an educational perspective how, why it's good to do business, for example, and negotiate a fair deal with, um, with an indigenous group, wherever they may be in, uh, in Canada and the United States or in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, because, you know, we are the closest ties to those lands and waters. And, you know, I can probably generally say that, you know, in Can- Canada, you know, Canadian law and to some extent American law recognizes that. Uh, most importantly in Canada, they do because the constitutional rights that are built in for Indigenous people, similar to the Maoris in New Zealand. And uh, the uh, the notion of doing business, uh, educating them on doing that business is a win-win versus it's a, you know, it's a hindrance, uh, you know, a pain in the pain in the rear that, oh, man, we got to get their approval or we got to get their, their buy-in. Uh, they don't know what you know, they don't know what we do here. And, and you know, some companies have been varied, you know, the big mining companies like BHP and Valet and Wailu, uh, you know, um, used to fight those type of things. And now they uh, actually embrace those type of uh, things. Um, a lot of other type of companies uh, will also do that. And now we're also finding financial markets. So, uh, you know, what's the secret sauce there? I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a secret sauce other than uh, taking the time to, um, to explain how it works and, um, you know, making sure that we have the same, uh, I guess, starting point on proceeding to an agreement to get involved, whether it's on uh, helicopters or camp catering or providing mining equipment, you know, like what is it that we both want out of this situation? So unfortunately, Dirk, there's no secret sauce. <laughs> yeah. and, educate, and, educate, educate. Yeah. And that can be, right. The secret sauce can be hard work and persistence and just sticking with it. And, and I think mm-hmm. that, that counts, if you will, as, as secret sauce and people, uh, especially context you're describing, right? To think you can go in quickly and get the deal done and we're out of here, right? This is not how it works, right? We're we're taking a much bigger view here, a much longer view, a much broader view and educating people who may come from a different culture where you make a quick deal quickly in and out. That is something I think that is valuable now if you negotiate around the world with all kinds of different people from different backgrounds yeah. who, who have a different view of time and and and, and different view on, on many yeah, I was just, uh, yeah, Sorry for interrupting, but I was yeah. just involved in a uh, negotiation uh, yesterday where a company, a, you know, a big global company uh, was saying to uh, me and others, you know, like we've been, we've been in this uh, business for a hundred years doing this. So I looked at one of my counterparts um, who is, uh, you know, obviously an Aboriginal person. I said, well, how long have we been in this, uh, uh, this territory where they're currently doing their operations? And he said, well, we've been here thousands of years. <laughs> so, you know, like them saying, well, we've been doing this for a hundred years. And then we went, well, we've been here a thousand years, 10,000 years. You know, what are you going to say to that? So, yeah, yeah, but it is always they didn't so, know what to say. They didn't know what to say, Dirk. No, no, no. It's, like, it's always uh, so tempting. Uh, you <laughs> you pick something up from the other side like this and you say, Yeah, hundred, I've got thousands, right? This is a good <laughs> this is a good moment in negotiation when they, yeah, when they exactly. put that up for you, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so 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 we we um under under understand that and and so the the, the thing maybe to um move to um next here is do you do you see like like think about young people working in international context taking an approach um to negotiation and i think you did stress how important it is to have a durable agreement that everybody can live with not just right now but for a long time and in in your context for a very long time um really mm-hmm. do, do, you, do you think that is something um, and that, that you think is, is important for leaders just in the modern world, anywhere in your context, but really in any context where we, where we have such a diversity of cultures and, and issues and where we need to really build agreements 
that are durable, that 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 can last, that are not just a quick solution to 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 a problem. Yeah, I think um, uh, what I find, um, you know, when I'm negotiating on behalf of uh, the indigenous community, and, and part, you know, the, I find it a great boon is the fact that I'm from an indigenous background too, and uh, you know, I've lived on reservation lands, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, understand the you know, the good parts of it and the, you know, the negative parts of doing so. But uh, what I've noticed for sure is that uh, when a, a tribe or a, a subset of the tribe negotiates with a, a company um, or a government, they become very loyal to that, that particular deal that they've struck. Mm -hmm. And by creating that loyalty they also expect the reciprocal you know the, that that government or that entity becomes it's just as loyal to them so you know there's a long history where you know treaties and other types of agreements were signed with uh, many tribes in north america and the treaties were broken and words were broken and over a hundreds sometimes you know 500 years and causes a lot of anguish but you know there's always room for uh creating more modern modern agreements but really specific to like say if we did a deal with uh, a company like sedexo which is based out of paris big food service uh, and other health services type of logistics company you know they uh, uh i think they as a company it's uh and maybe it's because it's kind of owned by one particular family in the scheme of things, but they understand the value of that kind of loyalty. And, uh, you know, my, my community member too has had a long relationship with them and it's not only been for Canada, it's also, you know, been involved in other, other places, uh, around the world. You know, I remember uh, being asked by them to help, uh, with uh, something that's going on with indigenous peoples in Peru or in Panama. And so they're saying, how, uh, how can you can you help us? Again, because it's that loyalty of relationship. They didn't have to go seek someone else out to, to uh, they knew what we could do to uh, make things better for another group somewhere else. And they were trying to make it better for someone else. So I, I, I think... Um, in the scheme of things, how do you create that uh, long-term relationships, like with any any entity, whether it's government uh, or a, a corporate uh, business? Uh, is uh, if you have a good uh, relationship and uh, you know obviously a good deal, then the parties would become loyal to that, and uh, for the most part, you know the uh, a document written and you know formalized on paper is really evidence of that relationship and sometimes uh, which you've probably seen too dirk is the fact that sometimes people don't even look at those agreements they just yeah. say okay well okay we got to you know we got something that evidences that agreement or our relationship it's almost like uh, they work on more of a handshake but they seem to have a, a deal paper just to evidence that relationship so i think when you get into those aspects of loyalty and uh honor honor and respect for each other i think that creates long-lasting um friendships and uh long-lasting relationships to you know to keep growing the the business or the the social um governance systems that you created with that uh, that particular entity whether it's government or uh, corporation yeah Bert, let me actually um that's uh such a, a interesting point that you that you made here and, and maybe i want to uh, stay with that point a little bit that you just made and and so i think it's important again as people look at negotiation and what i'm trying to achieve and again in my experience is this tremendous focus on what's the deal. But here it sounds like you're saying, I'm negotiating for two things. I'm negotiating for an outcome and I'm negotiating for a relationship. It's just fascinating to me if I got that right. Maybe I have to ask over time that a company like uh, uh, Sodexo out of Paris says, I've gotten to know Bernd here during our negotiation. And even though he was negotiating for the other side, so to speak, we developed a relationship, we trust him, that now not only did you achieve a good outcome with Sodexo, but they're asking you 
to help you in a similar situation because they 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 trust you your, mm -hmm. your character mm -hmm. they trust your skill and so what you've built here it's not just i made a good deal with sodexo um i also build a strong relationship with sodexo and maybe what we're telling people here who are listening you want to go in with that mindset that you're having both in mind that you have the result and the relationship in mind just want to ask that one more yeah. pointedly here. yeah 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 no that's the you know you you uh summarize it very well and uh ultimately it's uh you know you, you want to maybe this comes from my cultural background like you know we live in uh, certain areas and you got to kind of work with your community and uh you know when you're bringing a, a, a new government or a, like in this case a company a global company or even a local company you're bringing them into your environment and you want to make sure you work together in a very respectful way yeah you know like everything isn't perfect sometimes it starts off really negative it's this whole concept of us versus them and you're trying not to end with that you're trying to create a an us uh you know a partner um versus uh, the language of us versus them and uh, you know getting into positional bargaining and negotiations you know, that's what you don't want because those deals and those relationships never never ever 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 last because they they break down fast because someone is very upset they had to compromise they had to give this up they had to give that up and seen as take 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 versus give 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 on both sides right yeah and and so i i think again if we put it here into uh negotiation um technical terms i don't want to say jargon technical uh terms that it's it's not transactional it is relational it is looking for that outcome that that both parties see as beneficial and i think people throw the term win-win around too too easily but but i think this is what we're talking about and this is what takes the extra work in a, in a negotiation and i need to start again with that ambition of achieving that even as you say sometimes i i i, I start out and it's you know it's it doesn't come as quickly trust isn't built quickly it takes some time and then we're back to the secret sauce of hard hard work here so yeah. so thanks for um for sharing that and again with a with a fantastic uh, to me a fantastic um example of what that really looks like and how far that relationship um can can go all right everyone i'm going to jump in here and pause the conversation it's so interesting so fascinating but there's a lot more to be said so please stay tuned for part two as i said this is a two-part interview next one will be following up very shortly and that's when dirk and mr christmas are going to be leaning more into the topics of politics, international relations, and of course I'll have a couple questions that are especially relevant for those of us who are emerging leaders or new in our careers, so stay tuned. But as always, if you have any comments, any questions, or would like to reach out to Dirk and I here at the Genoir Leadership Podcast, please feel free, send us an email at podcast at That's podcast at genoir.com.